I invite you to take a moment to greet one another with a wave and a nod and a uh, welcome to those who are joining us online. A reminder, especially to those who join us online, that we will be celebrating the Sacrament of Communion today, so you may like to have your elements for communion available uh, uh, when that time comes. As we begin our time of worship, we will light our Christ candle. I see Hilda coming forward to do that. In the name of Jesus Christ, who calls us to seek justice and resist, resist evil, to love and serve others, let us worship God. The light of this candle is a sign of Christ's presence with us. In the assurance of Christ's presence, may our hearts and minds and hands be open in service to Christ's way of life and love in the world. Let us pray. Eternal God, we have gathered in community to remind ourselves that we are always in your presence. In the midst of many voices that surround us, teach us to be attentive to your voice. In the midst of all the pressures of our daily living, make us long to do your will. Grant us the courage to shine in shadowed places and to fearlessly seek your truth in the trust that your truth will set us free. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us join together singing our first hymn in more voices at number 135, called by earth and sky.
that hymn leads us well into the theme for learning time today. We begin the season of creation as we start this, season, this uh, month of September. A practice began around 1989 when ecumenical patriarch Demetrios, uh, Eastern Orthodox, I'm not sure what uh, particular branch that would be, proclaimed that September 1st would be a day of prayer for the environment. Uh, years later, in the year 2000, the Lutheran congregation in Australia de developed a four-week celebration of creation. And that practice has spread throughout that nation and beyond. Eventually, the Vatican picked up that practice, and the World Council of Churches also promoted this new liturgical season within this season following Pentecost. So during these weeks, Christians are urged to recognize the theological centrality of God, the creator, creation itself, and the human vocation of caring for creation and doing justice on behalf of the earth and all of earth's inhabitants. For all of its struggles internally, especially here in the West, Christianity remains the world's largest religion, and it's incumbent upon people of faith to work for Earth's healing and renewal in this time of crisis. Christians bear the burden of being part of the problem as many Christian traditions have badly muddled theologies of creation and promoted practices that colonized and destroyed the very world we were instructed to keep and till. The season of creation is marked by repentance for that past, a call to deepen theological reflection and spiritual awareness of creation, and to engage in justice on behalf of nature and our neighbors. Attending to creation in liturgy, prayer, scripture, and spirituality may be one of the most significant theological shifts in contemporary Christianity and is certainly one of the most needed. The World Day of Prayer for Creation and the Season of Creation is not a kind of offhand, our thoughts and prayers are with you sort of thing. It is an invitation to experience faith differently, to center creation and the Creator and to learn the Bible and theology anew. This day invites us to metanoia, a profound change of heart and life, a genuine con conversion towards a creation-based vision of God, nature, and neighbor. And with some words from uh, the Metropolitan Callistos of Dioclea, writes, we humans are bound to God and to one another in a cosmic covenant that also includes all of the other living creatures on the face of the earth. I will make for you a covenant on that day with the living, with the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the creeping things of the ground. We humans are not saved from the world, but with the, but with the world. And that means with the animals. Moreover, this cosmic covenant is not something that we humans have devised, but it is, it is, but it has its source in the divine realm. It's conferred upon us as a gift by God. So as we move into a season looking at creation, our place within creation, our theology, uh, and calling towards creation, I'd like to offer you a challenge in this time to think of things that are common to you, whether it's scriptures that you know, stories from scripture, prayers that you, that, that you say, songs that you sing, that bring our spirituality of creation forward. So like the hymn that we sang first, is a hymn about creation, maybe that's one thing that comes to mind for you. Are there scripture readings that think, make you think about how we live in this creation and how we help to heal this creation? So I might come back to that in the next few weeks and see what you've found. So um, 
There's my, my challenge for us in this season of creation. And as we continue in worship, I invite us to join together singing once again from More Voices at number 172, God Says. And as you're singing that, you can maybe think, where's creation in this hymn? 172, God Says. The first reading today is from the Hebrew Bible of Exodus, chapter 3, beginning at verse 1 through to verse 15. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come, no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I've come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them, now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? 
God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, This you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this my title for all generations. This ends the first reading. The second reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 21 to 28. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any wish to come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is part of our sacred story. Thanks be to God. So it's been a few weeks now since our vacation time, and it was wonderful that we had the opportunity to do some traveling in that time. And last year, we had a larger trip in our summer vacation, going to places that we had never seen before. And of course, both last year and this year, we had our cameras at the ready, ready to take as many pictures. And with cell phones now that have high quality uh, cameras as part of them, we can take many pictures. And as they're digital fo photographs, we can then sort through them and discard the ones that we don't want. And does anybody actually ever discard their pictures? I find I just have a longer scroll of things to go through looking for them. Maybe if I'm smart, I'll actually put them into different albums in my photographs, but that's a whole other story. But we go to places that we either haven't seen before or haven't seen for quite some time, and there we discover beautiful, unusual scenes and vistas. And I like to think that I can take a picture well. Doing so, I look for balance, color, contrast, and I can make, make a picture that I think could, could hang on a wall or be posted on Instagram. I don't know Instagram very well, but I understand it's a social media where capturing the best pictures that gain the most attention is an important part of it. And then a few years ago, I took a course. It was an online course on the spirituality of photography. And it was interesting and informative, and it, in some ways, changed my thinking. One of the principles of spirituality is receiving what is offered. Receiving. Now, later in worship, when we celebrate communion, 
you will receive communion. At least you'll receive the bread. We still ask you to take the cup of juice, but receive the bread. There's a spiritual practice of receiving what comes to you, paying attention to it, noticing all that it has to offer you, considering how it relates to other things that you've received. And pictures and images can be received. The spiritual, spirituality of photography emphasized how we receive images using our cameras. And one part of the course was sharing the images that we did receive. We were only able to, to share a certain number of them, so part of the task that we had as students in that course was to decide which ones we would like to share. And each participant in the course included some description with what they shared of what they received in that image. It was such a gift that uh, receiving other people's received images. Now, it's going to sound like I'm changing, changing track here, but I'm really not. Moses was out tending the flocks with his, of his father-in-law. Last Sunday, we began the Exodus story, and we heard about Moses as a newborn infant. Well, we skip ahead the rest of a chapter and into the next chapter, and we see that he's grown up in the palace of the Pharaoh, but at some point his eyes were opened to the oppression of slavery. And from a rash, impulsive action, Moses was then forced to flee for his life. And in doing so, he found himself among a family of sheep herders. One day, Moses was out tending the flocks of his father-in-law. And he approached Mount Horeb with the sheep. Now, it sounds quite normal when you're thinking of somebody tending sheep. Well, they get to this mountain area. But the lands around Mount Horeb were not very good for grazing. It was something that was something drawing Moses to that place. Why would he make his way there with the flocks when there was not good grazing land there? I said earlier about a photographer receiving an image with a camera and paying attention to that received image. Well, Moses' attention was caught by a bush that appeared to be burning. Now, this was not even good land for scrub bushes. So that there was a bush there in the first place definitely drew his attention. And that that bush was on fire, but not seeming to be consumed by fire, that drew his attention as well. And it seems that when Moses pays attention, when he receives an image, a revelation, an awareness of something that he did not know before, his life is changed. He was called to something greater than he had known. He saw the brutality of slavery among his people, never having known that they were his people, discovering that, that he was of those people who were slaves. And the rage that filled him as he saw that brutality moved him to actions that could never be turned back. He killed a brutal Egyptian slave driver, and from that, he would never be welcomed back in the household of the Pharaoh again. He paid attention to that revelation that came to him. His life was changed, and he was called to wilderness regions. But Moses' calling wasn't finished yet. Just as the revelation of the brutality of slavery pushed him out of Egypt and the royal household, that attention-grabbing, burning bush pushed him back to Egypt, a calling that would change lives and history. Incidentally, the burning bush is one of the images that we have on our United Church crest, and it's 
featured in one of our stained glass windows that pick up on those different images of the crest. We see in Moses the call that arises from watching, listening, and paying attention. And that's a call that works in our hearts as well. What's calling our attention this day? What are the needs of the world and of our community? What draws your heart and your attention? Like Moses, does that call return to you with more intensity and more need? A few examples came to mind for me as I was thinking about this. Over the years, we've heard the need to pay attention to the environment. We've heard words like pollution and acid rain. And now, with a burning bush, like a burning bush, our attention is drawn to the stifling heat waves every summer, it seems, and relentless wildfires that are more dangerous than ever before. Within our wider society, we've heard about prejudice and discrimination on the basis of race. More recently, the murder of George Floyd was that burning bush moment that focused our attention on systemic racism. And we've also learned about the marginalization of indigenous people in this land. And we've heard words of apology, and we've heard calls to action from truth and reconciliation hearings. And then when 215 unmarked graves were revealed at the Kamloops Residential School, the focus of our attention was like the burning bush that pushed Moses back to Egypt, to his calling. That's calling our attention this day. Those are just three things that came to mind for me as I was thinking about this. There likely are others. What are the needs of the world and the community that come into focus? Now, if I move to the New Testament reading today, we see that Jesus' call to Peter and the disciples is a little bit different, but it's also related. As Jesus' ministry unrolled, and people of the towns and villages around started to hear him and learn of the things that he was doing, there was excitement and there was anticipation. And they started wondering if this Jesus person was one of the prophets of old, come back to them. Maybe like Jeremiah, or maybe more recently like John the Baptist. And then, as we heard last week, Peter was so bold as to say, Jesus, you are the Messiah, the one who brings peace and justice to the people who are hurting and oppressed. And then Jesus had a calling for them. He needed the disciples, all of them, to understand that that was no victory march. It says that he began to show them that this, what this revelation meant. It meant that he would go to Jerusalem and that he would be rejected and he would suffer and he would be killed on the cross and he would be raised again. And more than just telling them again and again, because when you hear something, it can be gone in a moment, he needed to show them that they must lose their life to save it. They must take up their cross to follow him. Moses was uncertain about his call to bring freedom to the slaves of Egypt. Jesus' disciples were uncertain what the call to take up their cross would mean. We learn our calling to pay attention 
And it may be like the camera receiving an image when we pay attention to what we, what we see. The calling we receive will seem like more than we can handle. But we have the assurance that God is with us as we follow where God calls us. Let us learn, then, to receive God's grace and mercy, compassion and strength, when we least expect it. Thanks be to the one who calls, the one who is and always will be. Amen. Let us join together singing from Voices United at number 567, Will You Come and Follow Me? 567. beloved in faith and hope in joy and in love we make our offerings then some of the offerings come at this time as we gather other offerings come at other times and by other means yet all are made in response to God's great love Let us pray. We bring our gifts to you, God. Here is the work of our hands, and here is the love of our hearts. Accept them and use them through Jesus Christ, our beloved. Amen. In response to God's great love for us and the offerings that we make, let's join together singing, What can I do? What can I bring? What can I say? What can I sing? I'll sing with joy, I'll say a prayer, I'll bring my love, I'll do my share. More Voices 191.
invite you to follow the liturgy for uh, communion which you received. This is Christ's table. And we are guests at Christ's table. And all who seek to follow the ways of Christ are welcome to come to this table. Today, as we serve communion, we'll be invited to come by way of the center aisle to a station at the front here. I ask you to put out your hands to receive the bread, and then you can, may take that, and then take one of the cups um, uh, of juice, and then partake of that, and then there's a receptacle for the cups there. The bread that is offered is gluten-free, um, and if anyone's not able to come forward, we'll come to you when others have been served. Please join with me in the, in the uh, liturgy. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of light, giver of all life, source of love. You guide the sun and cradle the moon and toss the stars, and at your word the earth was made and spun on its course among the planets. You breathe life into us, and you set us among all your creatures in a covenant of love and service. Even when we turn away from you, you do not forsake us. You send your prophets to proclaim your justice, to remind us of your promise of peace, to call us back to you. Creator, Christ and Spirit, we praise you for your love revealed to us in Jesus, who walks with us our wisdom and our way, sharing our joy and sorrow, healing the sick, feeding the hungry, and setting the captive free. So it is that we join the song of all creation to proclaim your goodness. Holy, holy, holy God, power of life and love, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna through the ages. Blessed is the one who comes to bring your justice to earth. Hosanna through the ages. Mighty and tender God, in Jesus of Nazareth, we recognize the fullness of your grace, light, life, and love, revealed in words that confront and comfort us, in teachings that challenge and change us, in compassion that heals and frees us. And now we gather at this table to remember and to be filled with such longing for your realm that we may rise together to turn our worship into witness and to follow in your way. We remember that when Jesus ate with his disciples, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Each time you do this, remember me. And then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he passed it to his friends, saying, Drink, this cup that is poured out for you is the promise of God made in my blood. Whenever you drink it, remember me. At this time, we also remember all with whom you would have us share your feast, and so we offer our prayers to others who are not with us, whose concerns touch our hearts. We pray for all who are in sorrow or in pain. All who are ill or alone. All who live with fear, oppression, or hunger. For all whom the world counts as last and least, And in our prayers, we pray for the church and its varied ministries. We pray for nations as they strive and that they would strive for peace and justice. And we pray for our families and friends. Loving God, 
We rejoice in the gift of your grace, remembering Christ's life and death, proclaiming his resurrection, waiting in hope for his coming again. Grant that in praise and thanksgiving, we may so offer ourselves to you that our lives may proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Send, O God, your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts, that all who share this loaf and this cup may be the body of Christ, light, life, and love in the world. In this hope and as your people, we praise you, through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory is yours, God most holy, now and forever, and let the people say, Amen. Amen. With Jesus we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Jesus Christ, the true vine. All is prepared. I invite a server to come forward and, and we'll get things prepared and then come by way of the center aisle and, uh, and uh, be served.
Let us join in the prayer after communion. Life-giving God, may we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink this cup bring new life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us so that we and all your children shall be free and all creation will live to praise your name. Amen. Let us join together singing from Voices United, number 506, Take My Life and Let It Be. Go into the world in peace. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and always. Peace be with you, and let us sing of that peace to one another. Peace be with you, peace forever. Peace be with you, my friends, till we meet again. May God be with you. Peace, peace, peace. Mm -hmm.